for the most part, the, the wetlands is really thriving and, and it's been a big success story. You know, it's a fairly stunning bit of environmental engineering and restoration. One day we, it was extremely wet. That place was under a lot of water. I think the landscapers were in snowshoes sometimes and they had a boat rig to plant some of the plants out there. We planted thousands and thousands of sedges in one day and we came back the next morning and the Canadian geese had pulled every single one and eaten all the roots. That was just the challenge of, you know, actually implementing the project. Early during the design process, the, there was still cattle out there. This was a working farm and um, in particular, there was a big bull out there named Bubba that, that chased around our design team quite a bit. I still have a picture of Bubba in my office that I keep. You, know, you don't realize it when you start a project like this uh, 15, 16 years later. You know, these are the types of projects that you get to work on maybe once or twice in a lifetime. We design the project with ecological principles in mind. We know from ecological science that that ecosystems develop slowly and that if you set the ball in motion and you put plants out there that are appropriate for early developmental stages that they will eventually develop into mature ecosystem. A lot of attention was paid to the topography, the form of the land that's out there on the floodplain of our site. Um, we put in low areas, depressions where water would accumulate and grasses would grow and red-legged frogs and Pacific tree frogs could breed and thrive and right next door to that we created mounds where plants that didn't like getting their feet wet, so to speak, could exist. We have a whole host of species out there that weren't there when it was cow pasture. So we've got the salmon and we've got the beaver and we've got the coyote and many, many, many birds. So the biodiversity has exploded. They went well beyond what was required from a permanent standpoint. Construction started in the late 1990s. They were aware that there would be runoff coming off the campus and they built a system to slow down that runoff on its journey and to, to clean it up before it got to North Creek. The, the restoration of the wetlands included a relocation of North Creek and, and part of that relocation effort included uh, building a new stream channel for North Creek, uh, taking it back to its original meander. And that channel had been straightened in the early 1900s. Uh, with levees and it was used primarily to transport logs. The stream is designed to, to actually flood on, a, on an annual basis. And by restoring that floodplain it provides a huge biogeochemical or you know water quality function so as these flows come down it provides this filter that could improve water quality before it dumps into the larger Sammamish, which then eventually goes into the Lake Washington. We've done a tremendous job at creating salmon habitat and setting in motion a floodplain ecosystem that will clean the water before water gets into Puget Sound. And therefore, our site here becomes not just effective in meeting those regional goals, but it becomes an example. This site is used used by government agencies who regulate wetlands and their restoration, agencies like the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, the Washington State Department of Ecology. They bring staff here to see an example of a truly successful wetland restoration. Um, but it also provides this, this um, enormous educational resource. No, I've never seen a skunk. They like the beavers. They build a den. I would definitely recommend the tours to any age group. I think uh, young children as well as adults can learn, learn a lot of things about the animals that live in the wetlands and the things that the gardeners do to preserve the area. The university has really set a great example for the region. They have this full-time maintenance staff out there. Diligent stewardship has really made this project a grand success. A lot of maintenance that goes into replanting plants that have died or removing invasive species that are coming in. Um, a lot of monitoring 
gathering data to see what's working and not working, and then adaptive management of using that information to change our methods out there so that it works. You're out there when uh, some things are kind of going to bed and other things are, you know, other animals are waking up and it's kind of coming to life, you know, so. Right now we have to walk, you know, it's thick. We're going through bushes and we're looking for one type of flower that's hidden all throughout it. So it's kind of like, almost like a scavenger hunt or something. We're basically removing plants for the majority of that time. Uh, in the wintertime we do install trees, plant trees, plant conifers, propagate trees. We get a, a few thousand, two to four thousand conifers every year, bare root seedlings that we put in the ground. We've got a, a great teaching laboratory. We do go out and use our wetland not only for regular labs but also even you know short uh, classroom time periods where we can't get off campus and we'll just go out and check out something out there. So it is um, very much used as a living lab. I tend to focus more with my students on our inputs from the campus into the wetlands, so looking at the stormwater runoff that gets out into the wetlands and the quality of that water. So everything we can do in the uplands to keep that water quality the highest, that being not dumping chemicals in the landscape, it means um, in many instances uh, people walking and biking to work as opposed to driving and having the, the uh, chemicals dripping out of their car which goes into the wetland system. So whether that means you're a homeowner and you put less fertilizer on your lawn or you pick up your dog poop, right? there's all sorts of things that we can do to enhance our water quality. Another way to help sort of protect this system is show interest in it, right? So come visit 